book of Daniel chapter 9. Uh, I wanted to introduce it to you from the New Testament, but we'll go back there. Look at Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. Here is the great prophecy that is continuously unfolding even today. Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Here's what it says. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. We know what that date was. 26 AD, some would say. But not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood. And till the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the midst of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Tremendous prophecy talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the end of time. I don't have time to go into those detailed points, but I brought you over here to show that he is called the Messiah. He is the Messiah in the Old Testament. It's translated the Christ in the New Testament. The, the appointed, uh, uh, the, the uh, anointed one of God who fought the battle for you and for me. Jesus, our risen Lord. But I want you to notice how John, in his gospel, chapter 1, go over there, if you will, John chapter 1, and let's notice the, incidentally, all of the gospels uh, comprise the unfolding revelation of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? We're taking that study. Amen. The New Testament. All that you read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the unfolding of the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether by miracles, by special assignments. All that you see is that Jesus is revealing himself and then you come to the book of Revelation, this final revelation where, where the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed in splendor and in glory in the midst of, of, a, mount, uh, of, of, of a lot of, of what, what you might say uh, the, uh, the time of uh, Jacob's trouble dealing with the nation of Israel. But look at John chapter 1, if you will, and verse um, 39. I'm going down to 41, but at least 41. Here's what it says in verse 39. He said to them, come and see. They asked, hey, where, where are you? That's what the disciples said. Rabboni, uh, where, are you, uh, try, where are you staying, teacher? And he said to them, come and see. And he still has that invitation out. Come and see. Come and see. They came and they saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard him speak 
and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first finds his own brother Simon and says to him, We have found the who? Messiah. Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. A few comments here. The word Andrew is a word from which we get the male species. Andrew was a strong male. The two words for a man in the Bible. One talks about uh, just the male species, the other one talks about male and female. Andrew comes from a word which means a strong man. And this strong man was seen often in the New Testament bringing people to Christ. And I would suggest that any man who really wants to occupy as God would have him to occupy will be eager to introduce people to the Lord Jesus Christ. He may not become the most popular one because Andrew goes and he finds his brother and he says to Peter, hey come, I found him whom Moses in the law and all of the prophets spoke about. God wrote about him. Here is the Messiah. Can you imagine the hilarious attitude that went with that speech? Everybody knew that God was going to send a redeemer. They looked for that, right? And finally, Andrew goes to his brother and he says, Oh, yes, I found the long-awaited Messiah, the anointed one, the one who can throw off the yoke of Rome, many of them thought in those days, but Jesus didn't come as a political leader. Jesus came as a savior. And Andrew took his brother, Peter, to Christ. And what happened to Peter? Peter found Jesus and just took off. Became that number one spokesman. Became that stone, <laughs> Cephas, the stone. So I would like to suggest and challenge us to always be on our guard, reaching out to other people trying to bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Billy Graham actually wrote a track on this one, the Andrew uh, Ministry uh, Program of Evangelism. Mm -hmm. One man or one woman going to one woman or one man and introducing them to the Lord Jesus Christ, helping them to understand who the Lord Jesus is. Well, it was Andrew who introduced the little lad, you know, that fixed his lunch that day in John chapter 6. And uh, Jesus said, uh, uh, Philip came and said, how are we going to feed all of these people? And Jesus said, why don't you give them some food to eat? <laughs> Me? 6,000 people? Feed them? And then somebody said, well, there is a lad here who has a little lunch. Three body loaves and two fish. But what is that among all of these people? And Andrew said, let's take him to Jesus. He needs some food? Let's take him to Jesus. Whatever your needs are, bring them to Jesus. And Jesus, and when, when, when Andrew took the little lad and his three barley loaves and fish to Jesus Christ, Jesus simply said to the disciples, okay, gather around, guys. We're going to feed this multitude. He prayed over it. And they just kept on coming back to Jesus to get the replenishment. You need to be refilled, rejuvenated, strengthened, encouraged. Come on back to Jesus. And as they came back to Jesus, the three barley loaves and fish, they multiplied. And they kept on multiplying. And they multiplied and multiplied. And uh, they actually 
after it was all over, you know, I noticed the people serving on yesterday, thank you for that. Somebody said, we ran out of hot dogs. Somebody didn't get a hot dog. Sorry about that. <laughs> when, when they got through serving the five barley loaves and two fish and uh, 5,000 people, plus men and women, probably may have been 15,000 people ate that boy's lunch that day. That's what Jesus will do for you. Come on back to him. Get another replenishment. And he will give you what you need. And you take your basket, go out among the crowd, and everybody went away stuffed. <laughs> Feeling great. But it was Andrew who brought the little lad to Jesus. And then there's another passage, I think it's in Luke 12, where there were some Greeks. And they were wondering what to do. And uh, Andrew said, I'll take you to Jesus. Uh, so if you want to be a strong man, introduce people to Jesus Christ. And when you introduce them to Jesus Christ, you bring them to the solution to all of their problems. How, it, how amazing it is that so many times we think that some man can solve our problems. We turn our back up on Jesus. We don't want to come to worship. But we come in to ask for somebody to feel sorry for us and to give us something. And as we try to do to minister to other people, we are here to do just that. But we're here to introduce people to the Savior. And if you don't want my Jesus, then there's not very much that I can do because I too am a man just like you. Amen? Amen? You say, you, you preacher calling yourself a man just like you. That's, that's the essence of it. But I can introduce you to an unlimited resource and supply. And his name is Jesus. And Andrew had that wisdom. Peter took off, right? Who is it that won 3,000 souls on the day of Pentecost? It's Peter. Not Andrew. Peter. Who is it that became the leader among the apostles? Who is it that walked on the water in response to the command of Jesus when uh, he, he saw, uh, saw Jesus walking on the water and, and Peter said, Lord, is it you? Yes, it is. Well, bid that I come to you. He said, come on. Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on water. And I'm sure the waves were boisterous and the, the waves were roaring around him. And Peter began to look down and he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. Amen. He cried to the right person Amen. whose name is Jesus Christ. And I dare you to go to him and to cry out to him and ask him for help. He will satisfy your ever need. I have found him. Yes, I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. You see, I, I love him this morning, and he loves you. You cannot imagine how much he loves you. For the love of Christ is extended to every man, woman, boy or girl, it doesn't matter how low you have fallen, how deep you think you have uh, drifted away from God, God loves you. And he wants to meet your need. Are you excited about him? I am so thankful to God for that man who came into Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church in Richland, Mississippi and stood up and quoted Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, you don't, you don't understand the black church in the USA. And I'm not saying that I know all that there is to be known about it, but you can hear that verse quoted now in almost any church. But there was a day when you know how people got saved? They came down the aisle 
And they went up and shook the preacher's hand. And that meant salvation for them. I don't use the term the doors of the church are open because they have been open since Calvary. Amen. Jesus opened the doors of the church and they are still open. And I just got through reading the autobiography of Dr. Robert Hunter, a 96-year-old man who departed this life, a great thinker, wrote down information about FBFA, has my name in the book in many places as well. But I just got through reading about his autobiography, his autobiography. And the black church up to, let's say, 25 years ago, that was the invitation that people were given in order to believe on Jesus. The doors of the church are open. Come shake the preacher's hand. No Bible lesson, no follow-up, no discipleship. No explanation of what the word of God had. That was the black church in the USA. And in many cases, I'm sure I'm not trying to incriminate anybody, but the Caucasian church in those days would not accept us. That's history. That's a matter of fact. Thank God today that those places are open. Amen. And we can go for the most place most case now, to worship with people who at one point did not accept us. Amen. If you're isolated in a situation where you can't have the word of God in, your, in the context of your own people, find a church that preaches the word of God Amen. and unite with that church and let yourself grow Amen. in grace and in the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord. Many mistakes were made. One brother, uh, and uh, I don't mean to drift on this one, but it is relevant. Dr. John Greenan, he was the president of the GRBC. And something happened in our association when it first got started in 1961.